morning. Come on in and find a seat. I'm happy to welcome you to First Pres. My name is Ryan Seiler and I'm part of the Worship Arts team. We are so glad that you are here today, whether you're joining us online or here in the sanctuary. We pray that the gospel will resonate deeply with you and that here you will find a family of believers to walk with you. Our Welcome Center is located just behind you in the large room outside of the sanctuary. There you can find out more about us. You can also connect right where you are. In the back of the pew in front of you, you'll see a connection card with the QR code at the bottom. Run the camera of your smartphone over the code and you'll be linked to ways to get involved at First Pres. Do you know of someone who would make a good elder or deacon for our church? Are you that person? We want to hear from you. Nomination forms are available at the front desk and in the Great Hall. We encourage you to pray about who to nominate and then fill out one of our forms and turn it into us. Check out February's first look. You can find out more about ministries like the Ewing's Missionary Outreach to Young Adults in Japan, a new Alpha class beginning in March, and also upcoming events like the Stephen Curtis Chapman concert coming up April 3rd. Pick up a copy today at our Welcome Center or find it on our app. Today in the Great Hall, you have a chance to encourage someone who really needs it. Be sure to find our women's evening circle table and send a valentine along with a blanket in the name of Jesus. We are grateful for your giving. Your giving helps share Jesus to Edmund and the world. You can give online now through our app or later in the services as the ushers come by. We are happy that you're here with us. Now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Hey, good morning, everybody here in the sanctuary online. Let's jump on up. Let's worship together. Let's place our battles at the feet of the Lord this morning. Sing it out. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see. Shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. All right, make this your prayer. Say it today. So when I
Good to know that you can come and bring those things to him this morning. Lay him at his feet. Let us just magnify the Lord together this morning. Lift his name. Exalt you, Lord. Above our worries, above our doubts, the troubles we bring into this time of worship today. We lay them at your feet. Within my heart is a melody that was not taught in the darkest night it still goes on the anthem of my God within my heart is a treasure that cannot be bought when all else is faded it will not the presence of my God, magnify. Oh, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt His name together. No one beside You, Lord. Honor and praise are Yours.
have a seat for just a minute. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I want to share uh, Philippians 1, 20 through 21 with you real quick. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's take a minute with that. If you'd bow your heads with me and just start to process through how do I exalt Christ in my daily walk? How do I magnify him? How do I empty myself of me to be filled with his Holy Spirit? Lord, this is not natural to us. We're selfish. As we walk through our day, as we put our first steps onto the floor when we get out of bed, give us your perspective, Lord, your perspective on the people that we will walk into contact with, on the circumstances that will come at us. How can I magnify you? How can I glorify you better, Lord? Thank you, Lord, for music. Thank you for that gift that you give us. As I was driving down the road, I heard the song that says, the king of heaven wants me. Lord, what an awesome truth that you want me. Thank you for that. And for our kids and our teenagers and our college students, please remind them, Lord, that those truths that were hidden in their hearts as little kids, that the king of the universe wants them. That's who you are. You are a good father. You are a kind father. You're a merciful father. And we thank you for your, your grace that is sufficient for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
we sing this just for yourself. I will bow to lies. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be for my feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a door to resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my soul. Father, may you be lifted high and magnified today through the praise of your people as we hear your word, as we receive your word, and it calls us and challenges us to step out of ourself and into your glory so that you may be magnified. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is a great day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've all been stuck at home the last few days, but the sun is out shining, and the weather is great, and the snow is melting, and here we are to worship Jesus. It is a great morning. I do want to take a minute to thank you all for the cards, the letters, the texts. As you know, it's been a rough week. We had a terrible chief's loss last Sunday, and the way the congregation has cared for me the last week has just been awesome. Uh, there's, we'll display the link to the meal train up here for people uh, to care, show your care. But no, we this morning, we are, uh, we are back in looking at the life of John the Baptist. And we were talking about what I think is one of the great phrases in all of Scripture, a phrase that we can really, that should really encourage us and strengthen us. He must increase, I must decrease. Listen to the word of the Lord, John 3, 22 through 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained with them there and was baptizing. And John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not been yet put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi... He who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. And John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him um, from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is a bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. 
Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, my prayer this morning as we dive into your word is that you would increase and that we would decrease. That your Holy Spirit would come and take license and, and liberty and move in our hearts and move in our minds and give us liberty. Freedom from sin, freedom from fear, freedom from envy and strife and jealousy and all the fruits of the flesh so that we would hear your word this morning and it'd be transforming, Lord God. We thank you for what you'll do in the next few minutes. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. A few years ago, I was driving on this road between Tennessee and, and uh, Kentucky. It was a road that I, I never traveled on before. I knew nothing about. And I saw a sign for a place on the National Historic Register of Places. Now, normally, unless my wife Jen is with me, who loves history, I just write places like that off. I just keep on driving and look for the next uh, convenience store where I can stop. But I recognize the name of the place for my studies in church history. It is the Red River Meeting House. The Red River Meeting House. What is a Red River, what is a Red River Meeting House? I'm glad you asked. It is recognized as the beginning location of the Second Great Awakening, one of the greatest spiritual events in the history of our country and even the world. And it started off as this camp meeting, the kind of thing that we might today call a family camp. In, in June of 1800, dozens of families from several churches in the area came to the Red River Meeting House where they were led by a Presbyterian pastor. And they all received communion, and when they did, the Holy Spirit fell. And people began testifying and giving their life to Christ and confessing their sins and changing their habits and, and practices. And as the meeting got louder and more boisterous, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit increasingly fell, the Presbyterians twi tried to quiet people down because things became so disorderly. <laughs> but soon, even they got caught up in the spiritual fervor. Even the most dot-in-the-wool, staunchest predestinarian Calvinist was jumping up and down and rolling on the floor like they were part of the Triple Rock, Holy Ghost Fire, Church of What's Happening Now, full gospel house of worship and waffles. They went nuts. It was this amazing outpouring of, the, of God's grace, and it spread throughout the country, forever changing America and the American church. And the Presbyterian pastor who led it all called it the most glorious time that our guilty eyes have ever beheld. There is no more Presbyterian statement in the history of the world than that one right there. So the Holy Spirit did this amazing, world-changing work in that place. But you go there today, it's just a log cabin with a metal sign outside, out in front, and you can look with a magnifying glass at every blade of grass, at, at all the chinking in between the logs, and not see any proof of a miraculous heavenly outpouring that happened there. God's work increased and then suddenly decreased. And the Holy Spirit went on to increase somewhere else in the world, just like he did with John the Baptist. And so today what we're talking about is a new phase of John's ministry when his ministry coexisted alongside Jesus' ministry. And John's ministry began to decline, and, and John's work began to decrease while Jesus' work increased. John's gospel tells us this, John chapter 3 again. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. And John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. And so Jesus and his disciples had begun baptizing people in the hill country of Judah, uh, not far from where, from where John had been, had been baptizing. And Jesus, you may remember, was about six months younger than John, and Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. And so for this brief period of time, probably no more than a few months, Jesus' ministry and John's ministry happened side by side. 
They were both preaching and teaching in two separate locations, and Jesus' ministry grew and John's waned. And at least among a few people, this created a controversy. John 3, 25 through, through 26. A discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. Is there anything people love more than controversy? Anything at all? I mean, I mean, even among Christians, people who know God, people who should know better, folks are going to try to create controversy. So this unnamed Jewish man was drawing a distinction between the worth of Jesus' baptism and John's baptism. And it appears he was saying that Jesus' baptism was better than John's, holier and purer than John's baptism. And he did this as a way of telling John's disciples that everyone's going to Jesus now and no one is staying here to be baptized by John. And so John's disciples went to him and said, Jesus, or John, Jesus is baptizing everybody now. No one is coming here. Your cousin Jesus is going to put our ministry right out of business. And i got to be honest with you. It's a little comforting to know that people leaving one ministry and going to another ministry that seems newer and better is an old problem. This is something every pastor, every church knows about. At the church I served in Kansas City, there was a great church right down the street from us. I know the lead pastor. We're still in touch to this day. They had been a new church development about 10 years before I got there, and they built this amazing facility at this awesome location. And he is a gifted teacher, and they prioritize the right things. They have great ministries. They have a lot of great people. And sometimes a family would migrate over from our church to theirs. And it made sense. It was a great church. But this bothered greatly some people who believed in our mission and our vision and in what we were doing. And to be honest, I didn't care for it much either. But I know it was my fleshly side. I know it was my sin nature because I knew those folks were going to a great church. And I've learned, and I've learned that a lot of people are more bothered when people leave their church to go to another church than they are when someone just stops going to church altogether. Because at least in the latter case, we didn't lose someone to the competition. And the realization and the whole experience caused me to ask some really intentional questions of my ministry. Like, is my ministry about me? Or is it about Jesus? Am I more committed to building God's kingdom or am I more committed to building my own? And I'm glad I got to the point where I could ask questions like that. Um, it came after a lot of pain, a lot of fear. And I admit it's not easy still at times. John was way ahead of me. John's disciples said, hey, John, everyone's being baptized by Jesus. They're leaving you. They're going to him. In other words, they're going to the new church with the shiny building just right down the street. Here's how John responded. John answered, John chapter 3 again, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John knew something really, really important here. Everything we have comes from God's hand. And John knew that he must decrease and Jesus must increase. To live the fullness of his life and his mission required less of him and more of Jesus. And we're the same. We need more of Jesus and less of me. But isn't this so very counterintuitive? Isn't it? I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it go against almost everything that we've been taught? 
I mean, uh, I mean, we've been taught that if, if we want to be all that we have been made to be, we cannot be less than we are. And so we're consumed today with increasing. We want more of everything. More money and, and more stuff and more power and more authority and a better title and a better office and a better home, a better family, a better school. And we judge people's worth and we judge their influence and their value by the number of followers they have on social media or by how many books or articles or blogs they've written or how many people listen to their podcast. We're all about the increase. And you know what? It's literally killing us. Literally killing us. But if we want to know the fullness of life that Jesus intends for which he died and rose again, we must decrease. We need more of Jesus and less of me. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? John's biographer, uh, Frederick Brotherton Myers, whose book we've been in and out of throughout the sermon series, put it like this. I love the way he puts this. There's so much wisdom in this. The only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. The only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. You see, this is one of the keys to the Christian life. Crafting the habit and the pattern of turning continually toward Jesus. It's like the glow of the rising sun that overwhelms the lesser lights of the moon and the stars every morning. We must allow the light of Jesus to shine in our life daily. And so throughout this series, we've looked a couple of times at this 500-year-old painting uh, called The Crucifixion. It's part of something called the Eisenheim Altarpiece of Jesus on the Cross. It was painted by a, by a German artist named Matthias Grunewald. He was a man of incredible faith, a man who knew Jesus very well, and his intimacy with Jesus comes out in his art. And he literally intended this piece of art to be a commentary on the Christian life. And we can spend a whole series just talking about the painting. We're going to talk about two little things today that talk about how we get more of Jesus and less of us. You see, in this painting, John stands with an open Bible at the foot of the cross. And Jesus' twisted and broken body hangs over him, and he's speaking this very phrase. It's in Latin in the painting, but I'll translate it for you. You've heard already, he must increase and I must decrease. And his work is a visual illustration of allowing Jesus to increase and ourselves to decrease. And the first thing we notice in this painting is that John stands not only close to Jesus, but he stands close to the cross. He stands close to the cross. You see, unless we know a crucified Jesus and we fully understand the reason for his crucifixion, in all its offense, in all its shame, in all its terror, we don't fully know Jesus. The uh, Swiss theologian, Karl Barth, kept a copy of this painting over his writing desk. He looked at it every day as he wrote millions of words. <laughs> he wrote this about the crucified Christ. He said, in the death of Jesus Christ, God has humiliated himself and rendered himself up in order to accomplish his law upon sinful man by taking his place. And thus, once for all, removing from him to himself the curse that affects him, meaning us, the punishment we deserve. If we don't know Christ crucified, if we don't plant ourselves at the foot of the cross, we don't know the real Jesus. A little while ago, I stumbled upon a, a podcast called Jesus and Islam. And, and it, was, it was a Muslim scholar, and he made his career, has made his career studying Jesus. That's all he does is he studies Jesus. He talked about how Jesus is a great teacher, one of the greatest teachers. He said that Jesus is a man that all Muslims should revere and honor. But he also shared that, that he doesn't believe that Jesus died on the cross. 
He said, it's inconceivable that Allah would allow a man like Jesus to die such a horrible death. Instead, he claimed that Jesus' betrayer, Judas, died in his place. And, and, and it only appeared that Jesus died. And we talked about the same thing last week. Elisa Childers mentioned last week that some Christians struggle with Jesus' death on the cross because they perceive a blood sacrifice of God's only Son for the sins of the world as something that is barbaric. And so when said for them, Jesus is merely a good moral example of what we need to follow. And if he died on the cross, that's merely a metaphor for being unselfish and, and the danger of speaking truth to power. But here's the real truth. The real truth is, is that unless we embrace the cross, unless we camp at its very base and understand why our sin makes the cross so necessary, we don't understand Jesus. This is why Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing more among you than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so we need the crucified Jesus because we are dead in our sin. We are dead to knowing the fullness of life for which we have been made. And we will struggle and we will strive and we will strain and work until we are exhausted to become the fullness of what we believe we're supposed to be. But as Charles Spurgeon said, we must be tethered to the cross. You know, I can't tell you the number of people with whom I have sat who are well along in life, and by any measure, they are successful. They have everything this world can offer. They are celebrated in, in their career, and they are well-educated, and they are wealthy, and they have great families, and they vacation in beautiful places around the world. And compared to 99.99% of people who have ever lived, they live in absolute paradise. Paradise. And in many cases, they're, they're even part of a church. Have been for years. But they come face to face with the reality that that this question lingers. And the question is, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Their own self-critique of their life comes down to this question. Is that all there is? They haven't faced the reality that they're dead in their sin. To know the fullness of life, to know the peace that Jesus promises to know the courage, to know the power, to know the love, to know the grace that Scripture says we are intended to have. Jesus must be more than a friend. He must be our Savior. He must be a living sacrifice. We must place ourselves at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to take away our sin and give us his grace. In other words, we ask him to increase so we can decrease. <laughs> More of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. The second thing we see in this painting is we see that John has an open Bible in his hands. An open Bible. And it is a big Bible, too. Just look, look, look at the size. That's like, it's almost like, it's almost like this. You see that thing? It's almost, it's almost this size here. So it's a good sized Bible. Knowing God's word, cherishing his word, living by his word is so very important if we're going to allow Jesus to increase in our lives. That's why one of our core practices here at First Press is read and practice scripture. And survey after survey on the Christian life says this. If you want to do one thing to grow your relationship with Jesus, if you want to cultivate one habit that will make all the difference in knowing the fullness of life Jesus intends, spend time in God's Word daily. Just like God's Word created teeming, abundant life and a dark and formless void into which He spoke, allowing God's Word to permeate our spirit, even if our spirit is a dark, chaotic void, it'll create abundant life. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit did for John. Do you think it was difficult for John after he had sacrificed so much to see his ministry, after he had rocked the world and changed thousands of lives, to see his ministry begin to diminish and decline, and have people he invested in come to him and say, you know, this guy Jesus is taking all your people. Well, we get no indication it was difficult for John. In fact, John even said that allowing Jesus to increase and himself to decrease made his joy complete. And this kind of thinking for us is really hard to understand if we think of it from a human point of view. But you see, John had joy at Jesus' increase and his decrease for a simple reason. John trusted God's word. He trusted his promises. He trusted his purposes. He trusted his plan for his life. Immediately after John talked about Jesus increasing and he decreasing, here's what he said. He said, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what has been seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets a seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit with out measure. So John drew this distinction between earthly words and the word of God, and he did not confuse the two. One word comes from a world broken by the power of sin. So it is fractured, it is impartial, it is incomplete. Its truth and authority is limited. The other word comes from above. It is from the kingdom of heaven, and so it is perfect, and it is true, and its authority is ultimate. More of Jesus, less of me. And the only way we learn to distinguish between these two words is by encountering God's word. And how it works is actually really, really simple. It works exactly the way it does in our life. The more we listen to someone, the more time we spend with someone, the more we learn how they sound. So, so um, here's, a, here's an example of this. There's this common email scam that tries to victimize some of you every so often. Someone sets up a false email using my name, and they send an email uh, acting like me asking for help. And this has happened to almost every pastor that I know. So the, the, the scammers get points for being creative here. But when you read the email, it doesn't really sound like me. What it sounds like is somebody trying to sound like a Presbyterian pastor. So they, think, so they say things like, blessings, my friend, or God's peace to you, which I really never say. But if you didn't know me, you might think, well, he might say things like that. I don't. And if we don't know what Jesus sounds like, we are likely to give all kinds of voices, all kinds of influences in our life, amazing authority, and we often do it with the very best of intentions. Like we'll fall for things like this, like God helps those who help themselves, or human beings, human beings are basically good, or, 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 uh, or it's okay to hate, or God just wants you to be happy. All kinds of half-truths that are really common today. But it's also not just knowing what Jesus sounds like, knowing what God sounds like. The Bible tells us that even Satan and the demons know God's word. Satan tempted Jesus using God's word, and he even used really obscure passages to do it. So he knows the word well. They just don't give God's word authority. If we want more of Jesus and less of me, we will make God's word the ultimate authority in our life. There is abundant life. There is astonishing life amid even death when we give God's word authority. A lot of you here know our elder, Crystal DePew, and her daughter, Jeannie. If you know Crystal and Jeannie, then you know that Jeannie's dad, Crystal's first husband, Jim, was killed 37 years ago last month by a school shooter. 
Jim was the principal of a junior high school in Kansas, and he stepped out in a hallway to stop a 14-year-old boy from walking into the classroom carrying a handgun. And instead of shooting up a class of children, the boy instead shot Jim. Jim and Crystal's children were 10 and 7 and 5 at the time, and she was six months pregnant. Now, there's, there's, there's no words for this, and, and I appreciate them letting me tell this story. It was an unimaginable tragedy, a, an evil event. It is the kind of thing that makes most people question God, and some people even turn away from God. Crystal's brother, James, on the day that Jim was shot, drove, with, drove to be with them that night. And as the family prayed before bed, James read to them from Psalm 68, which reads, His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless, protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And for 37 years, that family has relied on that promise. For 37 years, that family has given authority and trust to God's word, and they have seen his faithfulness. Well, this week, James died after a long illness. But what a legacy of trusting God's word he left behind. A legacy of trusting God's word that is still creating new life. Literally speaking, God's word created life amid death. And, and, and you think of all the things a human being could be tempted to say in a moment of tragedy and pain. You think about someone might be tempted to speak out of their own wisdom or, or, or their own insight or, or offer platitudes at such a moment or just be speechless. Instead, James spoke God's word. Jesus increased and he decreased. <laughs> More of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. There are some who say we need another great awakening in the church. There there, there are some who are looking for a moment just like the one at the Red River Meeting House. And they say the fate of the church, even the fate of our nation depends upon it. And we can pray for that. We can pray for that, and and I hope we do. But for that kind of thing to happen in the church. We need more of Jesus and less of me. We are so self-centered as the body of Christ. We have made it all about us. But he must increase and we must increase. We must plant ourselves at the foot of the cross and, and preaching the forgiveness of sin by the shed blood of God's only Son and laying aside a gospel of self-improvement and self-fulfillment and self-awareness and personal progress, laying all that aside. We must hide the Word of God in our heart and, and hold on to its unrivaled authority and stop allowing our hearts and our minds to be formed by social media and, and cable news and self-selected talking heads that echo our political convictions and confirm our biases. Jesus must increase, and we must decrease. So more of Jesus, less of me. And next week, we'll talk about how the world really doesn't like that. They really don't. Amen. Uh, Friends, we are about to partake in the Lord's Supper, and this is the joyful feast of the people of God for the people of God. I wanted to share with you from John's Gospel, chapter 6. When some of the, the people in the crowd came to Jesus, and they said to him, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven 
and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. Would you pray with me? Holy God, Father, the God of peace, you are holy and blessed in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For you sent him, your one and only Son, in whom all your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. And revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, received all who sought him. And Jesus lifted their burden of sin. And we glorify you for your great power and love at work in Jesus Christ. So now remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us. And we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of the bread and the cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. For he is the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this table is not a, a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. So if you have come to Jesus, if you believe in him, if you call him Lord and Savior, you're invited to partake. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as the Apostle Paul says, as long as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So you notice we have bread and juice on each side of this table. And so I'd like to invite uh, people to come forward and, and get your elements. Uh, if you would, when you get back to your seat, if you'll go ahead and receive the bread and open up your cup, but would you hold on to the cup until we're all served and then we'll drink together? So I'd like to start uh, by inviting the balcony to come down, and then we'll begin in, in these two middle sections, and if you would, exit your row on your left and then return on the other side. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. All is ready. Let's come forward, these two groups.
All glory be to God, the cup of salvation. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this communion. We thank you that you are the one who unifies the body. We thank you for the many people who will be sustained by your spirit to serve in your kingdom, Lord. We pray that the gospel would go out, that your word would go out, because we know that it does not return void. We thank you that you are God with us, that you are God for us, that you would never forsake us. We give you thanks for empowering us to be the hands and feet of Christ. And we pray that you would bring many, many to see you, Lord, in all your glory, to trust in you, Lord Jesus, to abide in you. Lord, thank you. And we give you all honor and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. And this is our prayer. This is the thought we leave with on our hearts and minds. He must increase and I must decrease. More of Jesus, less of me. And all God's people said, hallelujah, amen. Here I am.